and let's pray. Lord God in heaven, we gather together this morning to dig into your word. And as we open the gospel of John, uh, we ask, Lord, that you would reveal Jesus Christ to us. Lord, we know that all the scriptures have pointed to Jesus, and um, we have confirmed this over and over again. We look to the truth, not only the fact that the Bible points to Jesus, that you are pointing everything, all of mankind to Jesus, but that it is uh, meant to be calling us into a mission with you, to call us into a, a different walk of life, a, um, a different way to enjoy life, to uh, treasure things in life, to not follow the same paths of the world, <clears throat> uh, but to look more like your son. And so I pray that this, this morning, as we dig in, that the, it is an exercise to that end. Uh, Lord, we ask your blessing upon each one of us and ask that it ripple out to the world around us, the people that we engage with, and we in turn pray that this time, this conversation, this study is a blessing to you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so uh, last week we talked about the opening uh, to John. It was like the first 18 verses, and we, uh, we recognized that John was mimicking Genesis 1, or, or at least the opening, uh, uh, yeah, well, Genesis 1 and the creation and the way that he was presenting Jesus. And so we saw that um, he ended in verse 18. Let me go ahead and back up here. That's not it. Uh, it was... We ended in verse 18 where he said, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained dot, dot, dot. And again, in our Bibles, uh, we have inserted either the Father or Him or God, or we've inserted something there. But in the original language, that's left blank. And John left it blank because his intention was that if you want to know what he's explained, then read the rest of this story. And so uh, that's what we delve into today. We will begin uh, our, our finish up, at least our goal is to finish up John chapter 1. And like our previous study in Ezekiel, we will shoot for a chapter a week, and we'll see how that goes, even though we've already taken the first chapter and split it into two weeks. Any opening comments, thoughts, questions, any observations, any revelations from last week's material? Hey, Brian. Yes, sir. Um, you know... John the Baptist and, and uh, Jesus, weren't they cousins? Yes. Yeah. Did they did, did it say anything about them knowing each other when they grew up, uh, growing up? It doesn't, um, and there's a lot of discussion about that, uh, but... I was just wondering, you know, because he says, and like this was the first time he met him, maybe. I mean, and the way it sounds. Yeah, and... Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that passage where he says um, something to the effect of I did not recognize him. And so it, it might be not that he didn't recognize him as his cousin, but didn't recognize him as Messiah, maybe. But yes, and we get that from Mary visiting Elizabeth uh, when she was pregnant, when they were actually both pregnant. John is about six months older than... Motion detected. Uh, Jesus. Office. Motion detected. And I'm hoping my dog doesn't start barking. So, so I'll have to mute for just a second. Okay. Good question. Anybody else? All right. Let's jump in. We left off again with that verse that said, and he uh, is going to explain, and then he begins in verse 19. This is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent to him priests and Levites. Now we had uh, in our in our uh, introduction for context, we started talking about all the different people who are going to be introduced in uh, the Newer Testament. So we're already seeing priests and Levites, and from our studies in the past, we know that the priests and Levites. Their main job is to take care of 
uh, the temple and all the things concerning the temple. So, uh, and they also said that they are from Jerusalem. Should have a map up here so we can kind of have a geographical idea. That, and of course, the temple's in Jerusalem. And so uh, it says just here that the Jews sent him. We'll get a little bit more information here in a minute to ask him, who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed. It's interesting that they say that twice. He confessed, didn't deny, confessed uh, that I am not the Christ. And they ask him, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Okay. And then he says, are you the prophet? And he answered, no. And they said to him, well, who are you? So that we might give an answer to those who sent us. And what do you say about yourself? And he said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness, making straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. So um, start with just a simple idea here that this word testimony is uh, the same word. It's the, it's the, the Greek word that is basically uh, martyr. So you and I call a martyr someone who dies for their faith. But literally what a martyr is, is a witness or, or a testimony. And so John is a martyr in that sense. And again, we have expanded it to include in English language, it must include death, which we do see that through a lot of, uh, a lot of the witnesses in scripture, certainly with John. Um, but again, an interesting connection. So the Jews sent him the priest and Levites. They're, they're centered in uh, Jerusalem. They're asking, who are you? Part of the reason they're asking, who are you, is for religious purposes. You have a lot of people who are running around claiming to be messiahs also for uh, um, peace with the Romans. So if you've got somebody who's claiming something that could potentially be a disturbance to the empire, then the Jews who are uh, running Jerusalem they are kind of politically rubbing elbows with the Romans and they want to quell any potential uh, uprising or at least be aware of it so they kind of know which way the wind is blowing. Um, like we mentioned last week in service that uh, right around the time that Jesus was born, uh, there was a rebellion. It wasn't even a rebellion. It was a complaint that the Romans were robbing the Jewish temple and they crucified 2,000 Jews. So um, the people who were running the temple in Jerusalem, they had a vested interest to know if there's going to be any uprisings and, and who might be creating disturbances, which we'll see is, is precisely what they ended up using as their reason for taking Jesus to the Romans and saying, hey, this guy is creating problems. He's claiming to be king. We only have only one king, Caesar. So uh, you guys should kill him. Right. So then he confessed, did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. So all they ask is, who are you? And so there's a, an obvious underlying question. Are you the Messiah? Christ being the same word as Messiah. And he says, no. Uh, and then they asked him, that, are you Elijah? Now, there's uh, several scriptures that that feed into uh, um, who Elijah is supposed to be. So if you'll remember back from 2 Kings uh, chapter 1 or 2, Elijah uh, did not die, but he was taken up to heaven in a whirlwind. And uh, so there is a belief because of a compilation of passages from Malachi and, and that 2 Kings passage that when the Messiah comes, he will be preceded by a voice or Elijah uh, announcing his coming. So if you want to look it up um, in Malachi 3, verse 1, I'm sorry, Malachi 3, verse, yeah, verse 1, it says, Behold, I'm going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. So he's claiming he's going to send a messenger first. Later in Malachi, in chapter 4, he says, Behold, I'm going to send to you Elijah. He names him as Elijah at that point, the prophet, 
before the coming of the great terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. And so that I will not come and smile, uh, so that I will not come and smite the land, not smile, smite the land with a curse. Okay. Um, we also see in uh, Luke chapter one, Luke uh, refers to this passage when he says, and he will turn away the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so that they can prepare the way of the Lord. All right, so a lot of that coming into that question of, are you Elijah? And the interesting thing is that he says, I'm not. I'm not Elijah. But in Luke, it says that he is, but he's not Elijah specifically. He comes in the spirit of Elijah, the spirit and the power of Elijah. So he can say, no, I'm not technically Elijah, but he can come in the spirit and the power of Elijah. All right. Any, any questions up to that point? Okay. And then when he asks, are you the prophet? This is a reference to uh, Moses when Moses makes the statement and says that um, in Deuteronomy 18, he says, I'm going to, after me will come a prophet. And he makes the comment that uh, you will, you should listen to him because he will lead you to the Lord. This is a reference to, we see it, we know it as a reference to Jesus, but they're kind of dividing some of these up, the Christ or the prophet. And again, he answered no. And then they said, well, who are you? And so that we may give an answer to those who sent us. And then he says, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah <coughs> said. So in Isaiah chapter 40, you get this quote. And it says that there is a voice that is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness, make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. So, uh, it's, it's interesting because when you take Isaiah and Malachi and combine them together, then what that voice or who that voice is, is Elijah. And you have John stating, I'm not Elijah, but I'm crying the things that Elijah will cry. It's really kind of strange. John is, uh, I guess, typically seen as kind of a strange character. But John... John denies being Elijah, and yet he dresses like Elijah. One of the Gospels is very specific to state that he dressed in uh, uh, camel's hair and uh, girded himself in belt and ate locusts and honey. These are uh, references to Elijah. So he was mimicking that. A couple other things we see come up here. It says that he mimics Elijah. So he obviously, in some sense, sees himself as an Elijah-type figure, uh, so his his answer of not, he's not Elijah, uh, we can take to mean that he's he does not say that he's a resurrected Elijah or a not even resurrected since Elijah didn't die, but uh, a returning Elijah. Okay, any comment? Right, yeah, I was going to say, could he be like a uh, you know like they say the uh, temple is a shadow of of the uh, uh, gods. Area, so could John be like a shadow of Elijah? Yeah, yeah, I, I think, yeah, that would be, uh, yeah, another way of saying it, yeah, that, like going in the spirit and the power, yeah, I think that's that would be accurate, be a good way to see it, yeah, good. Anybody else? Okay, um, again, I had a, a little bit of a limited time this week, and, and there's a whole lot we can say about John the Baptist. And so um, when we divided up the different people of the Newer Testament, one of the groups that we said, uh, talked about were the Essenes who went out of Qumran. So they went out into the wilderness uh, near the Dead Sea, and they started a community there where they... Um, 
they took up this call from Isaiah to clear a way for the Lord in the wilderness. Uh, and so they literally went into the wilderness, began to live what they considered to be holy and righteous lives. And their goal was we're preparing a way for the Messiah. We're making straight his paths. So when you say make straight his paths, there is a visual that goes with this, because if you've been in, in Israel, that everything is mountainy and hilly. And so making straight a path would be uh, taking the mountains down and rising the valleys up. And so they have a nice smooth walking highway, so to speak. Uh, and also you can look at like Jeremiah who talks about uh, the ancient way. And the ancient way is the way that God wants us to walk. The ancient path that God wants us to walk. He wants us to walk in righteousness. He wants us to walk um, according to his uh, guidance, his laws, his test, his older Testament, his covenants. And so if we will follow those, then what we are doing is we are making the path straight. We are being righteous. In fact, uh, in Psalm 23, it says, uh, there are paths of righteousness. Uh, that's a, that's a, a shepherding term. And it's referring to the paths that sheep walk and sheep walk in straight lines. And so a path of righteousness is a, is a straight line. Um, so all of this is saying there's, there's a lot of people who believe that John the Baptist was part of this Essene community. Now, the, uh, the background of this is that John's father, Zechariah, no, is that right? And there's a statement by Jesus that says, since the time of Zechariah, uh, or making a reference to them killing Zechariah, sorry, I don't have the references in front of me. Um, and some people believe that I was referring to the prophet, but some think that maybe they're referring to John's father. Maybe John's father was killed as, um, as some sort of a prophet, which would have orphaned John and the Essene community was known to take orphans under their wing out into the wilderness and raise them in the Essene community. John uses a lot of the language of the Essene community. He lives in the wilderness like the Essenes. And so there's a good possibility that he spent some time in that Qumran society. All right. Then the next one, it says now in verse 24, now they had come uh, when they had been sent from the Pharisees. And so earlier it said they were sent by the Jews. Here we get the specific, the Pharisees or the ones that sent them, which is interesting because they sent them from Jerusalem. And so in Jerusalem, there is the ruling board uh, of the temple called the Sanhedrin that is made up of uh, Pharisees and Sadducees. And so it just must have been the, the Pharisees that were on the board there in Jerusalem that sent them to, to ask who John was, find out who John was. So they asked him and said to him, why then are you baptizing if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them saying, I baptize in water. This is the Jordan River. He would have been down baptizing in the Jordan River. But among you stands one whom you do not know. Uh, it is he who comes after me. The thong of whose sandal I'm not worthy to untie. These took place in uh, these things took place in Bethany beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. So uh, again, baptizing is one of these things where uh, it was most likely uh, a considered a mikvah, uh, and a mikvah was a, a ceremonial submersion in water. For um, it, it was kind of a repentance, an act of repentance, to state that. Lord, what I have messed up, I cleanse myself from, and I and I take a new path today to be more focused upon you. And so this is what John was calling people to, and we know that John was constantly calling people to repent. So it would have went right along with what the idea of a mikvah was. In most Jewish communities, uh, if they find a mikvah in archaeological digs, then they know that it was a Jewish community. And then he makes a statement that. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, 
whose sandal I'm not worthy to untie. So there was a, a Jewish, an ancient Jewish saying that said, every service which a slave performs for his master shall a disciple do for his teacher, except the loosing of his sandal thong. And so this was kind of uh, in, in rabbinic circles as r- rabbis took on students, they would be their servants uh, down to, but not including the point of untying their sandals. And John stating that I'm not even that worthy. I'm not even worthy enough compared to this person to untie his sandal thong. And then we get this detail that he's baptizing in Bethany beyond the Jordan. So this is a, another statement by John that is saying, um, hey, I'm not, while well, he says I'm not Elijah, he's acting a whole lot like Elijah. This is one of the locations, or this is the location where Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind as he stood with Elisha. So he's dressing like Elijah. He's using verbiage of Elijah. And he's uh, at the river, at the places. In fact, there's three different locations that we get with John the Baptist. And all three of those are places where Elijah were were, uh, on the river. Now, I want to notice um, another thing that's going on here. We have... Uh, John the Baptist is consistently mentioned in the Gospels as the one who's preceding Jesus. And then John the Baptist makes these comments like, okay, um, I'm here to point to Jesus. And so when Jesus is here, you you follow him. So he's deferring to to Jesus. Now, in the story of Elijah, when he gets a disciple, his disciple's name is Elisha. So they go to the uh, Jordan River, and Elisha asks Elijah, says, let, let me have a double portion of what you have. And then as we see Elisha's life play out, he does twice as many um, miracles as Elijah did. So we see this handing over of the mantles from Elijah to Elisha, And then we see a a double portion being handed to Elisha. Here we have John the Baptist, who's going to encounter Jesus. And he hands the mantle to Jesus. And then I think uh, the reason why we get this detail, it's, I think it's here. We'll get to it in a second, but here he says, uh, again, the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked, and behold, the Lamb of God, the two disciples heard him, and they followed Jesus. I think this is the reason John included this detail, is just because it's the double portion uh, aspect, idea, imagery that he's handing the mantle to Jesus. Okay, any comments, questions? Nope. All right. <clears throat> we jump to the next one then. And the next one states, the next day he saw Jesus coming to him and he said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And this is he on behalf, on behalf of whom I said, after me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. Uh, with this comment of the Lamb of God and the one who takes away the sins of the world, there's all kinds of places where this goes in scripture. Um, one of those, I, a lot of people will, oh, hold on, Janine's trying to get into this, into here. Um, one of these places is, um, when Abraham is trying to sacrifice Isaac 
and um, they're walking up the mountain and Isaac says, well, I, I see the, the wood for the offering and we have the um, everything we have for the offering except the lamb. And Abraham says, God will provide. And so there could be a reference here that says that when he says this is the lamb of God being the, the lamb that God is providing. Uh, there could be a reference to Exodus 12 and Passover because we know that later Jesus will be crucified on Passover. Uh, and there's a lamb selection day. So this could be a reference to that lamb that is selected for Passover. And there's also the possibility that in for the Day of Atonement, uh, there are two goats. While he says lamb uh, and atonement is two goats, one is, is banished out into the wilderness and one is for Yahweh or the, the goat or the sacrifice of God. And there's a possibility that maybe it's referring there. And of course, uh, in true biblical fashion, it could be all of those things kind of balled up into one. He's, he's intentionally reaching out and grabbing from all of these different imagery. And then he says he takes away the sin of the world. Um, that's what uh, the sacrifices do a lot for, um, for each of these ones that they come before God. Come back to that in a second. And then he says, uh, he makes this comment, he existed before me. We said when we started this morning that John is older than Jesus. John is about six months older than Jesus. So here, John is recognizes that Jesus pre-existed him. It's not just this uh, physical, earthly, human dwelling that Jesus is. He's something more than that. He says, I did not recognize him. And this is what Terry, we were talking about, saying that he didn't recognize him as as something other than simply human, his cousin, or maybe he didn't recognize him as Messiah <clears throat> or as God. But so that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. So John testified saying, I have seen the spirit descending as a dove out of heaven. And he remained upon him. And I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, he upon whom you see the spirit descending and remaining upon him. This is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen and have testified that this is the son of God. Um, I, we're going to be delving into a lot of Old Testament scripture because the New Testament, the Newer Testament is constantly, constantly, constantly referring back to the Older Testament. If you've got a Bible that shows you or highlights or uh, gives italics as to the places uh, that are quoting the Old Testament, it misses so many because, first of all, there's there's just so many to grasp. And a lot of them are just alluded to. They're not exactly quoted. Um, so we're going to jump to a couple of Old Testament passages in a second. But I want you to recognize here that in this process that uh, there is a combining of all the Trinity. So... We have John testified saying, I've seen the spirit. So first of all, we have the spirit descending as a dove. He remained upon him. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water, he, a reference to the father, and it says to me, he upon whom to see the spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen and have testified that this is the son. So you have uh, the father the Son, and the Spirit, who are all coming together at this time. We did a teaching a long time ago about Shmicha. And if you recall the details of Shmicha, it was the idea that as a uh, Shmicha was originally given to Moses at Mount Sinai, it was authority that was given to, to Moses at Mount Sinai to teach and uh, scripture to explain it to people. And then Moses gave that shmicha to 70 of his elders. And then those 70 were able to give shmicha authority to others if they saw them as worthy or able or blessed by God to do so. But it required two people who had shmicha to give it to someone so that they can receive shmicha. Now, Again, the English word we have for shmicha is either ordination or authority. So we see a lot of people when Jesus begins talking, they'll ask him, where did you get your authority? They're saying, where did you get your shmicha? 
And then when Jesus responds, is typically, tell me about John's baptism. So he's saying, well, first of all, it's a very Jewish thing to answer a question with a question. Second thing he does is he, he directs their attention back to the baptism. Because that's where this is where he receives his shmicha. And there's differing opinions. Is it John the Baptist and God who's giving him his shmicha? Or is it the Father and the Holy Spirit? I believe it's the Father and the Holy Spirit are the two who are directly giving shmicha to the Son. So you have um, the Spirit uh, descending upon him. And in other passages, we see that uh, the heavens open up and the Father says, this is my Son, who I, I am well pleased. So the confirmation of two. And he, Jesus is the only rabbi to receive shmicha directly from God uh, other than Moses. All right. Now, let's take a look at a couple passages from Isaiah, because he's making reference here to a couple passages from Isaiah. Any questions so far? Am I frozen? Can y'all hear me? Yeah. Yeah, we can hear you. My screen froze. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. I hear you, son. Hi, hi, Janine. Hi. I hear y'all got the son. I'm just, I've got the kids here, so I've got it muted. It doesn't want to go beyond this. We must be missing something on this screen. But it doesn't... There we go. Ooh. Okay. So uh, I know this is a, a lot. Oh, no. Come on. Yeah. The evil one is having fun with you today. Yeah, I'm telling you. Okay. So we're going to look at a passage out of Isaiah chapter 11 and 42. Uh, Isaiah chapter 11 is, is going to play in, in a couple different ways in this chapter. So just real quick, it says, Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. I just notice that it says a branch here, and it's talking about a, stu uh, a shoot springing from uh, the stem of Jesse. Uh, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. So this is what we're getting a reference to. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. So we see uh, John recognizing that the spirit rests upon Jesus. And this is the spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the spirit of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. And he will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make a decision by what his ears hear. In other words, he's not going to be uh, swayed by human things you know just because you show up dressed nice fancy in a nice car he's not going to treat you better than if you show up in rags and and walking with tattered shoes um, but with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked and also righteousness will be the belt about his loins and faithfulness the belt about his waist the wolf will dwell with the lamb the leopard will lie down with the young goat and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together a little boy will lead them also the cow and the bear will graze the young will lie down together the lion will eat straw like the ox and a nursing child will play at the hole of the cobra and a weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den they will not hurt nor destroy all my holy mountain for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the lord as the waters cover the sea now everything that we've been talking about lately what are we seeing here? Then in that day, the nations will resort to the root of Jesse, who will, which is this over here, uh, who will stand as a signal for the peoples. His resting place will be glorious. Then it will happen on that day that the Lord will again recover the second time with his hand, the remnant of his people. So there's a gathering of the people who will remain from Assyria, Egypt, Pathros, and from the islands of the sea. And he will lift up the standard for the nations and assemble the banished ones of Israel and will together gathered together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners. What is all of this explaining? 
when we're looking at everything and we've been saying everything is about creation and then decreation and then recreation, we're talking about recreation here. We're talking about this whole setting up of the entire uh, system and God is rebuilding, recreating everything. We're going back to a time when a wolf will dwell with the lamb and, and they weren't enemies. And this is pre-flood issues because of the flood is when uh, and after the sin and after the fall is when God um, basically introduced, um, uh, what's the word, uh, meat eating, you know, animals eating other animals, uh, humans eating animals. That to me, um, I'm seeing what's going on today in a lot of ways. Explain. What it's saying. What do you mean by that, Rosemary? Well, okay. Um, don't, okay. We're destroying. Okay. So we're, you see, we're doing the opposite of this. Because this is about the recreation. This is about things yeah. be, be, being. Yeah, I see. Yeah. That's what I'm seeing is that we're, we're doing the. Yeah, the opposite of what this says we should be doing. Right. Yeah. And so are we in a time of creation or decreation currently, do you feel like? I feel decreation. Yeah. So we're I just feel like we've been in decreation since the fall. <laughs> I think this passage is describing when Christ returns and restores everything back to the way it should be. What do you think? Yeah. Right. And that's what we're getting out of exactly right. So this is a reference again, the shoot, the spring from Jesse, a branch from his roots. This is a reference to the Messiah here. And it says the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, which is exactly what John is referring to. So when John says something like the spirit of the Lord rested upon him, descended out of heaven, what John has in mind is this whole thing. So John's like, oh, oh hey, this is the guy. This is the one. He's going to start this creation, recreating everything. And everything is, is going to be upon his shoulders. So he's making reference to this. Now, if we jump to Isaiah 42, um, he says, Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. Again, there's another reference to this. When God putting his spirit upon someone, and specifically the Messiah, he will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry out or raise his voice, nor make his voice heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. Very gentle person. And dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not be disheartened or crushed until he has established justice in the earth. This is part of his whole mission. is justice for all people. And the coastlands will wait expectantly for his law. Thus says God the Lord. He created the heavens and the earth. Look, we're getting this. He's, he's going right back to, oh, hey, remember, this is all about creation. He created heavens and stretched them out. He spread out the earth and its offspring. And so we're getting creation language. There's a whole theology of creation uh, that is permeating scripture who gives breath to the people on it. And this is uh, that reference to breathing life into people and the spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will also hold you by the hand and watch over you. And I will point you as covenant to the people, as light to the nations, to open the blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeons, to those who dwell in the darkness from the prison. I am the Lord that is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. Behold, the former things have come to pass. Now I declare new things. Here's the new things, new creation. Before they spring forth, I proclaim them to you. So all of this is creation language is talking about now, listen, this, the spirit has, has come down out of heaven upon this person, Jesus, and he is going to be uh, begin uh, the recreation that God has planned and designed. Okay, comments, questions, thoughts, because uh, again, this is this is huge, and man, the more the more you begin to grasp creation theology and scripture, the more you're going to see it pops up everywhere. Everything is is and. Understand, I'm using hyperbole, but so much keys upon creation idea and decreation. Again, we see decreation when the prophets talk about it. They're going to say the sun and the moon are going to black out, stars are going to fall from the sky. 
That's decreation. Noah's flood. In the creation, God separated the waters and dry land appeared. Noah's flood, the dry land disappears and the waters close back in over him. That's decreation. Okay? In creation, life. In decreation, death. In creation, light. In decreation, darkness. All right? So let's jump to the next passage here. To the lettuce. And it says in verse 35. Again, the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. I think this is um, bringing in some imagery. John keying upon this imagery of Elijah. He's uh, kind of alluding to it. And he looked at his Jesus as he walked and said, behold, this the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned, saw them following and said to them, what do you seek? Love that question. So I'm going to pause right here and I'm going to pose that question to you. So you've got somebody who uh, says, there's Jesus and, and you begin to follow Jesus. Okay. So maybe in your life, in, in maybe it's today, you know, I'm, I'm going to wake up this morning and I'm going to follow Jesus by by studying the word of God. And, and if Jesus were to show up and look you in the face and ask you the question, what do you seek? How would you respond to that? I think you'd say um, eternal life. Okay. Eternal life. All right. Good. What else? The kingdom of his righteousness. Okay, good. Yeah. Kingdom of his righteousness. Nice. And I'm, hey, I'm not saying there's a right answer or wrong answer. I'm just, I'm, what's in your mind? What's in your heart? What are you seeking? I seek his forgiveness. Forgiveness. Yes. Okay. I think it's a really potent question and one that we should ask frequently. Uh, I at least allow Jesus to ask us, why are we following him? Why, why do we bother to open up the pages of scripture? Hey, I'm not asking you. Sorry, hold on a second. Find my mute button. He wanted to say what he needed. Yeah, what she seeks is like, who's in the outer office right now? I hear somebody out there moving around. So, shh. all right. Um, but I think that's, yeah, a really uh, something we need to ask ourselves. Why is it, why are we doing what we're doing? And are we, are we, do we want it bad enough to allow Jesus to mold us, to allow scripture to mold us? Do we, is what we're seeking a, a powerful enough, strong enough uh, incentive and draw for us to say, yes, I will lay down everything else. This is the teaching that Jesus gives when he talks about the pearl of great price. And he talks about the woman who's lost a coin. He talks about uh, all of these things, the cost of discipleship. What is it that we're willing to do in order to find what it is that we seek? Is what we seek so valuable that we're willing to make the sacrifice for whatever that is, whatever you're, whatever you're seeking? But um, 
They said to the rabbi, their response is rabbi, which translated means teacher, which I think simply in that statement is stating, stating a lot. So understand that while we talk about rabbinic uh, thought and, and culture, that in this time, rabbi was not a title. Okay, Rabbi simply meant teacher. Uh, and in fact, in, in history, they will refer to this period of time, not as people who are rabbis, uh, sh sh not as rabbis, but they will refer to them as sages. And so, uh, sh I apologize for this. Um, so when they look to Jesus and they say, rabbi, what they're stating is, what we seek is for you to teach us. We're coming to you because you're a teacher and we want to be taught. And so that's why they call him rabbi. They're making that statement. Okay. Where are you staying? They're like, so we, we want to come and they're, they're kind of stating, we want to be your disciple. Uh, he said to them, come and you will see. And so they came and they saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour. 10th hour uh, in scripture means it was about four o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, the first hour starts at like 6 a.m. Uh, one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And he found first his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. Christ and Messiah mean the same thing. Messiah is uh, a Hebrew, Mashiach, and Christ is Greek. And so he brought them him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you're Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. It's not unusual that when you look to someone, you say, oh, you're a son of so-and-so. But there may be some significance here why he, he references Simon and specifically a couple of instances when he says, you are Simon, son of John, or Bariona, um, because that's the same name of the prophet, Jonah the prophet. And so Jonah's uh, was, is often referred to as the reluctant prophet because he was sent to Nineveh. But he was a prophet who was sent to Gentile people. So there may be some significance. And when Jesus refers to Simon specifically as Simon's son of Jonah, or John, that he's saying, listen, you're going to be following in the spirit and the power of Jonah, in a sense. In other words, you're going to, your mission will be to preach the message to the Gentiles, which we see that as the word spreads after the, the resurrection of Jesus, Peter is the very first one to take the message to, to the Gentiles. Okay, any comments on that? All right, I want to cover one more uh, uh, section here, two more slides, and see if we can do that by 930. So it says the next day he purposed, and, and I want to point out now, and, and hopefully I remember to come back to it later, it's pointing out days, the next day, the next day, the next day. I think that's significant. I want to do a little bit more study in it. But uh, so um, if you can remind me to come back to that maybe next week. Um, but it says he purposed to go. My screen's covered up. What's that say? To, into the purpose to go. To Galilee. Okay, to Galilee. And he found Philip and Jesus said to him, follow me. Really significant that Jesus says, follow me because um, sages at this time, they had disciples and I'll interchange the word sage and rabbis just for simplicity's sake. The sages had disciples, but the typical way that this occurred was a disciple would go to a sage and say, can I follow you? Here is completely different when Jesus goes to them and he says, hey, you follow me. Now, in the ancient world, to follow a, a sage uh, who has shmicha is kind of like being called uh, off of the, uh, the uh, 
the local park basketball court into the NBA. It's a huge, huge deal. And so it's not surprising that we see uh, these disciples drop what they're doing and follow Jesus when they're called into that life. Now, Philip, who was from Bethsaida, Bethsaida has got, uh, Bethsaida is the is a conjunction of two Hebrew words, bet, which is house, Theda, which is hunter. And they called fishermen hunters because they simply hunted fish. And so this is a house of hunters, uh, or the hunter's house, because it sat by the shoreline. It was a fishing village. Uh, somewhat insignificant, but for years and years and years, they've had this little town that tourists have gone to. They say, this is Bethsaida, uh, but just fairly recently, a man named Stephen Notley found a town uh, on the shore of Galilee, right where the Jordan empties in on the northern side. And they believe that to be Bethsaida now, as opposed to the other location. The other location is a couple miles away. And for a fishing village to be a couple miles away from the shore. And they had all kinds of reasons how they tried to uh, explain that. But it makes much more sense that what has recently been found is actually the real Bethsaida. So... Uh, Philip found Nathanael and he said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? There, there's so, so, so much that comes in here. So much of the Older Testament that comes flooding in here. And I want to point it all out. And I know that I'm missing probably 90% of it, but I want to point out everything that I'm seeing. But I also... Uh, I, I, I guess I need a, a thumbs up or a head nod from you guys that it's not like like just that I'm not just confusing you again. I, I, I don't doubt your all's ability. I doubt my. Uh, I get it. Okay, thank you. So first of all, when he talk about Bethsaida and it's the house of the hunter, and Jesus says, "Follow me." He's talking to fishermen. It's more pronounced than some of the other gospels but he has fishermen following him. This is right out of Jeremiah 16, 16. that says that when this new creation is established by the Messiah, he's going to set it up with fishermen. He's going to use fishermen who are going to go out into the four corners of the earth and bring back, capture all of the people like fish and bring them back for this new kingdom. So he, he's keying in on this whole idea again by choosing fishermen that he is setting up this new kingdom. Then you get this comment that, oh, he's from Nazareth. Can anything good come from Nazareth? It's hard to overstate the simplicity, the smallness, the, 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 the podunkness, if that's a word, of Nazareth. It was this little bitty tiny village that was really had a negative view of it in the ancient world. And this is where Nazareth, or where Jesus comes from. And then you see Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed whom is, there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, uh, How do you know me? And Jesus answered, said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe you will see greater things than these? And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens opened up and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. Uh, again, a lot of things that are coming in here. Uh, I want to, first of all, clue in on Nazareth. Uh, one of the other gospels says that uh, Jesus comes from Nazareth as the prophets foretold. Nowhere does a prophet say that the Messiah will come from a town called Nazareth. But what we do have is this passage in Isaiah chapter 11 that we looked at a moment ago. It says, then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. That word branch is the Hebrew word netzer. Netzer. And so when we have Nazareth, 
It is basically shoot town or branch town or twig town. And so this is the passage that they're referring to when they're saying the prophets foretold this. And they're saying this branch is coming from branch town, Nazareth, Nazareth. And then he made, has this conversation uh, and we get, he, he's making a reference back to Zechariah chapter three. He says, I'm going to bring in my, in my servant, the branch, again, the Netzer. For behold, the stone that I have set before Joshua on one stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave an inscription on it, declares the Lord of hosts. Now will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. And that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to sit under his under his vine and under his fig tree. So there's a reference to uh, the fig tree here. I feel like I, 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 uh, it is really late at night and I feel like I left off a part because then there's a reference to, uh, he says in his response to Jesus, He says, um, you are the king of Israel. So there is a, a reference in Zephaniah that refers to the fig tree and the king of Israel. So again, reaching into Isaiah and Zechariah and Zephaniah and pulling all this together. And Jesus is talking to people who got the Bible, for the most part, memorized. Okay, so when he's making all these different little illusions, boom, 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 they're picking up on them. And, and, and then you add to that, too, that there is a, there is a, a, an old saying that says that uh, basically a Jew who sits under the fig tree, a fig tree, uh, sitting under the fig tree is an idiom for studying scripture. And so you're getting this, uh, Nathaniel is probably someone who is, is even more so well-versed in scripture than the average Jew. Uh, so he may have been very well sitting under a fig tree, studying scripture at the time that Jesus has this conversation with him and making reference to the fig tree and how it speaks about him, the branch, the Netzer coming from Nazareth and how he is therefore claiming to be king of Israel. And he picks up on all of it, picks up on all of it. And then you have that reference to the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. Probably sounds familiar to you. Uh, you see this in uh, Genesis chapter 28 and we call it Jacob's ladder where Jacob has the dream of the angels ascending and descending on a stairway or a ladder. And uh, so there is this connection between earth and between heaven where God is interacting with mankind. And Jesus is basically stating, yeah, that's me. I'm the, I'm the place where God is interacting with mankind. Which, by the way, where is it that God interacts with mankind? This is a um, real general, real plain Genesis chapter one, God says, uh, let there be, let dry land appear. He pushes back the waters of chaos. So the dry land appears. And this is the location where God meets man on the dry land. This is where God dwells with man. So God creates in, in creation, God brings this place where God can interact with mankind. And then Jesus makes this statement, yeah, I'm that place. I am that person, that interaction. All right. I know this was a lot to cover in one chapter. Uh, um, any thoughts, questions, or comments about any of that? See if this comes out of my mouth right. It's interesting to think that Nathaniel was literally studying under a vine, and then he's going to study under uh well figurative vine you know jesus and it's even funnier you know i mean since the whole bible is about jesus it's he's studying jesus under the vine now he's going to study jesus under jesus exactly under the vine yeah 
that 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 exactly and oh man it is so you get your mind doing the, this figure eight thing and and how everything everything is so connected and and the the scripture and to what is being played out in scripture and what is being referred to in scripture and then all of that becomes scripture this it's really incredible once you try to begin seeing all the connections it's it, it's it's just it's mind-boggling i uh, one author says that the, these that the biblical authors are are um what's he call them uh, he calls them uh oh, i forget what he calls them basically he's talking about their ability to be able to intertwine all these ideas in their stories is just phenomenal of course they're being inspired by the holy spirit wordsmith no uh he used something more like ninja but uh but yeah literary ninjas that's what he calls them literary ninjas but yeah same thing wordsmith yeah. uh, gonna have to start Okay, good. Any other closing comments or thoughts? Uh, a lot thrown in there. All right. This, uh, this is all kind of John. Remember, John's focus is to, I want to, to explain who Jesus is and the idea that, that he is the light that's come into the darkness and we need to, um, we need to cling to him his whole purpose he wants people to believe so all of this wordsmithing all of this literary ninja stuff and, and tying it everything in the older testament we're seeing that john is emphatically stating and and this is one of the funny things too that when people say well jesus never claimed to be god he claimed to be god left and right and everything that he said and everything that he did he just never used those words i am god he did use the word i am he basically said it, Yahweh. But... All right. If there's no thoughts, let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this time in your word. And I do pray that uh, we can begin to absorb just a fraction of what you're doing here. Lord, it's so amazing. Uh, all of the things that you have pulled together throughout your entire word to point to the person of Jesus. And it is a bit overwhelming, if we're going to be honest, uh, but I pray that we continue to be good students and we'll begin to absorb it piece by piece and to place them in the proper perspective in the proper place and so that we can see, uh, see Jesus well. We can see how you have orchestrated history and scripture to point to him in who we call our Lord and Savior. Uh, so thank you for this time together. Thank you for this community who has a heart to know you. And uh, we can ask for your blessing upon us. Lord, may it change us, and may that change ripple out to the world, the worlds that we live in. Each one of us uh, impact and affect different people. And Lord, we pray that this time has been a blessing to you as well. We'll get this up in Jesus' name. Amen.